If that doesn't get your heart going this morning, I don't know what will. Friends, good morning, and welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. What this means is that no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your life's journey, where you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome here. There is a place for you here. We are thrilled. We're thrilled and honored to be worshiping together as a community of faith today. Welcome to those of you who are here at 814 Asylum Avenue. Welcome to those of you who are live streaming with us, as well as to those of you who will be catching the recording later on in the week via our YouTube channel. We are just delighted to be able to worship God together. It is not only really helpful, but it is necessary and vital for us to know who is worshiping with us today, whether you are here, whether you are virtually worshiping with us. I would ask that if it's not now, uh, after our worship service, you would check out our church's website, ahcc.org, and sign in. Uh, while you're there, you will also find a place where you can send in a virtual prayer request card. Uh, these, uh, this is also really important for Jordan and I as your pastors to know what is on your hearts and your minds, what it is we can be lifting in prayer with you and for you throughout the week. Hope that you are keeping connected to our Friday email as well as uh, your preferred uh, social media platform. Those are the best ways to keep up with all of the announcements, all of the uh, events and programming and opportunities for ministry that we have uh, coming up. There's lots of stuff being planned. Uh, it is hard to believe, but in just a few weeks from now, we will actually be starting our season of Advent. Um, and so there's lots of things coming up. So make sure that you are keeping connected to what matters to you. Uh, quick reminders about things that are happening uh, after worship today. Directly following our service uh, of worship, we will engage in coffee hour in Drew Hall. You can access Drew Hall by either door to the right or left of the uh, sanctuary. Um, in Twitchell, there will be an excellent and important presentation on composting. Um, this will be uh, from Blue Earth. Um, and I want to tell you, my family and I uh, started using Blue Earth and composting uh, a few months back. And it really, I have to say, has made a noticeable dent in the amount of garbage we produce. Food waste, friends, is, is actually a real thing. Um, and there are a number of really easy ways that we can uh, make a big difference in the kind of waste that we are producing. So if you're interested, uh, please come to Twitchell uh, after service, bring your coffee uh, with you, and this will, this will be informational, so maybe you're not ready to uh, dive headfirst into compost. Um, <laughs> maybe you are. Maybe you already are, um, but this will be very informational. So we would love for you to get information on this important endeavor. Also, Boar's Head tickets are now on sale uh, to our church community, and they will be open to the general public tomorrow. So I would say if you are interested in uh, getting your tickets today, please uh, see the front office after church. Um, that is where they are on sale. So get them while they are hot, friends. 12 o'clock, our free community meal uh, will take place in the parking lot. So um, I would ask that you either come on down uh, to help volunteer, uh, come on back to help volunteer. Uh, you can also donate um, to help fund this program. We also are always in need of water, bottled water, and um, snacks as well. However you connect um, to this important ministry, we are incredibly grateful. Grateful, And there is something else uh, special about today. If we couldn't get enough stuff packed in, uh, tell us about it, Jack. Absolutely. We have a very special guest with us here this morning, uh, Charles Miller. Charles was an uh, organist here at the church. <laughs> Charles, where are you? He's in the back. There he is. 
Charles was the organist here at Asylum Hill from 2000 to 2006. He was extremely instrumental in the renovations and additions to our amazing sanctuary organ that happened in 2004, 2005. Um, and Charles and I have been friends for a long time, knew each other even before he was here because we both went to the University of Michigan together um, and, and are both Michiganders. So uh, welcome, Charles, uh, and we look forward to hearing him play the postlude today. Welcome. And then, friends, uh, this week, uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. at Emanuel Congregational Church, just kind of around the corner from here, AHCC will be uh, participating in the Environmental Justice Forum. And I, I want to tell you a little bit um, about this forum and why it's really, really important. In the last Connecticut legislative session, uh, House Bill 6664, an act managing waste and creating a waste authority, was supposed to uh, better manage waste and address what happens now after the closing of the huge trash and energy plant property in the south end of Hartford. Some of you know about this closing. It, after this closing, uh, there has been a lot of toxins and things that have come into the air, and it affects really uh, a mostly low-income community uh, inhabited predominantly by people of color. Um, and that was supposed to pass during the last legislative session. But at the last minute, changes uh, were made to that bill and waste management was essentially uh, like a can kicked down the road. Um, now I know, now I know that when we hear about climate change and what climate change is doing uh, to our planet, we often kind of throw up our hands and sort of say, I don't know what I can do. I, I don't know um, what I as a solo person can do. It seems to be too much. But this is where this form, this really important form on Thursday evening comes in. Um, we can do something. As a community, we can show up, we can make our convictions known, we can let folks know how much we care about God's creation, about how much we care about God's people, about how much we care about the future of our planet. So I would like, I would love for all of us to come together as a community of faith and show up at that forum again Thursday evening, 7 p.m at Emanuel Congregational Church. This will be a time where we can raise our voices together. In two weeks, in two weeks, we are going to celebrate Thanksgiving Sunday here at AHCC, and we will have the opportunity to celebrate new members to our community. If you are sensing a call to be more formally connected to AHCC, uh, please reach out to myself or to Reverend Jordan. We'd love to help, that make, uh, help make that happen for you. And again, we look forward to celebrating all of our new members two weeks from now on Thanksgiving Sunday. Friends, look around. Look around at the people you are worshiping with. Let us take a deep collective breath. And let us now be called in to worship together if you might rise in body or in spirit. God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? God is our shelter and refuge on the days of trouble and our hope and joy on the days of celebration. Day after day, we seek God's face and the assurance of God's holy love. O oh God, do not turn from us or hide your face from us. Be our guide and our light instead. One thing we ask of God, that we may live in God's dwelling place all the days of our life and never cease to behold the beauty of God's home. Beloved of God, enter this worship in thanksgiving, for God is among and within us. 
Thanks be to God. Friends, one of the things that we have added to worship this fall is the passing of the peace. And I remind you, the passing of the peace is an ancient spiritual practice. It's not a time to discuss business. It's not a time to discuss getting the right tickets for Boar's Head. It's not a time to think about what meetings we have afterwards. It's a time where we get to look at one another, to look into one another's eyes, and to share the peace of Christ with another human being. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you.
I believe just what we needed to hear today, especially as we move in to a time of prayer. Friends, we are reminded that prayer is nothing more than an intimate conversation with the divine. A time where we quiet ourselves so that we might be able to speak to God. That we might be able to share with God all that resides on our hearts and spirits, the joys of our lives, the struggles, the challenges, the grief. But prayer is also a time where we have the honor, the opportunity, the privilege to listen to how it is God is speaking to us. Today and this week, I would ask that we would continue to hold in prayer Diane Natras, who is rehabbing at St. Mary Home, that we would keep close to our own hearts, Susan and Parker Simons, as they continue to grieve the death of their beloved son, that we would keep close to our hearts, Tracy Mayer Muska and Megan Mang, and their families as they mourn the loss of their father. That we would also keep close to our hearts, Debbie Sutherland, who is mourning and grieving the death of her youngest sister. The flowers on our altar today are in honor and joy and thanksgiving for Carol Terry's life. It was celebrated here in this sanctuary on Friday morning. So friends, let us now bring our hearts, our minds, our spirits into prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are ever so aware of our ties to the biblical world as we have today entered the world of Esther. And we regret that even today so little has changed in our public life since then. There is still high intrigue, intrigue in high places. There are still unholy alliances. There is still the dynamic of the fearful trying to do away with, or at least to get out of the way, perceived enemies or threats to their power. There is still the problem of evil in the guise of good. There is still deceit often used to gain selfish ends. So it will be, O oh God, world without end. Yet we ask your aid as we go about building our lives, our nation, and our world in this 21st century. May we not be disillusioned because of the deceit of people's hearts. May we not lose faith in people because of the faithlessness of the few. May we not fail to see this as your wonderful world or be dispirited. May we not lose a faithful and expectant spirit, which is expectant for good, expectant for hope, expectant for triumph. May we not lose hope in the ultimate triumph of good over evil. As in Esther's day, May we not forget to make days of feasting and thanksgiving and gladness and give you thanks for your goodness to us. In these difficult and tumultuous days, be with us, O oh God. For you are the one who turns sorrow into gladness, weakness into strength, defeat into triumph. And now, and now, in the stillness of this place, we lift our voices as one, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and continues to teach us today. We pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So this year at Asylum Hill Congregational Church, we are engaged in a wonderful theme to know and be known. And as part of our worship service together, one of the ways that we are helping to get to know one another just a little bit better is by having these bench moments. The, we're calling it the to know and be known bench. And every couple of weeks, inviting people uh, to share with us a particular part of their story. And today, I would like to invite Christina Hollister forward to share with us a little bit uh, about, about her. Good morning. Welcome. Have a seat. <laughs> so, Christina, for those of you who, for those of these folks who may not know you, how long have you been attending AHCC, and, and what's been your level of involvement here? Um, so I've been attending for about 20 years, but kind of officially members since about 2005. Um, my level of involvement, I would say, is pretty high, or has been. Um, Boar's head in it and backstage, served on several committees, um, working with the overnight shelter program that we had a few years ago. Um, and even especially during COVID in the very beginning when it felt you know, unsafe to be here, I came when I could. You know, We all donned our masks and I, I wanted to set an example to show that it was safe to be here. So I would say fairly, fairly steady and And what uh, you and I uh, had a conversation, I remember, uh, back in July, we had the uh, honor and opportunity of baptizing uh, your granddaughter uh, here. And you and I at that time had a conversation um, and you were talking a little bit about how sort of your engagement uh, had changed a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what, what was behind that? So um, it definitely has decreased to almost non-existent engagement. And my words to you was I was afraid. And I was afraid to come. I was afraid to be in a place of worship that, you know, has, um, as we see, been a target of violence and hate. And I'm just... Uh, my, my go-to response is to retreat and isolate. And I said it to you, I think just wanting you to know that it wasn't personal, but I needed to, to retreat. And, and your response to me was, you, you are too, but you were here. And that definitely, that definitely hit me. One of the reasons I really wanted you to um, be vulnerable is that I know that you are not alone. I know that there are others uh, in our community who fear, uh, who are afraid to come, um, who uh, have to muster a lot of courage uh, to be here. Um, and so we recognize that that is a reality in the times in which we are living. So can you, um, can you tell me, um, sort of what brought you here today. Um, and, and I think it was last week or two weeks ago um, that you came up to me and said, oh my gosh, I have a story to tell. Um, and and uh, it was the first time I had seen you back since probably July. Mm -hmm. And so what, what kind of brought that on? So uh, I think it was, uh, you're right, I don't know if it was last Sunday or the Sunday before, but it was Cornerstone Sunday. And my husband, Tim, was celebrating 41 years, and we were going to church. And, you know, it's not like I'm sitting home, like, paralyzed and, and shivering. I just, it's like, okay, we'll go. Like, I'm not thinking about it because it's so natural to go. And 
there was a reason. There was a real reason to go, just like July with the baptism. So um, we pull in, and right away we saw people that we hadn't seen since before COVID, friends. And um, you know, the fear was completely out of my mind, like it was non-existent. And then we came in, and we were greeted, and we said, oh, go find your name tag, which I thought was so cool. And so just like a new, new thing I hadn't experienced, and it's wonderful, by the way, I think it's terrific that name tags are um, if you don't know, they're in the hallway past your hall, and they're great, um, especially since you haven't seen people in a while, but also there's just so many new faces. So anyway, um, I saw people, you know, I'm familiar with our community, and so it just felt so loving and so safe. And I sat down and looked around and saw people that I hadn't seen, and and even as I sat there and thought about the terrible things that happened in places of worship, and I literally, you know, kind of gave myself a chance to think about, okay, this could happen right now. And I wasn't afraid because I was among friends and people who loved me and who I loved, and I, and I felt more empowered and safer than ever. And it was so different than what I expected. Um, and that's, that was, and, and I came up to you afterwards and I, there were like five, besides, besides that feeling, um, Tim will know this, he's the only one I told, but at the beginning of this year, I, because I was not feeling engaged, I said, I wanna write a note once a week to somebody that means a lot to me. And, um, and I said one, and that's as far as I got. And I <laughs> forgot, because it just, you know, life started, the new year started, it was a great idea, <laughs> but fell flat on, its feet, flat, flat on its face. And then I was sitting there during service, and all these ideas of, just inspiration came to me, and one of them was, because oh, I, I was thinking like, oh, I want to reach out to people, and then back in the recesses of my mind, I was like, oh yeah, you were supposed to do that. You had already committed to the fact that it was just sort of resurrected was magical, and of course it wasn't magical, it was divine, um, and I came up to you and said, you have no idea, like five things just happened to me today, and it was so good to be here, so that's kind of where Thank I'm you. Kind Friends, of what a uh, what is the uh, phrase that Jesus says most often? Anyone? Fear not. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Community is a very powerful, powerful thing. Thank you for reminding us of the power of community uh, to overcome even some of our deepest and greatest fears. Thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, a number of us from AHCC had the opportunity to go to the farminary at Princeton Theological Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. There were a group, I think, of about 14 or 15 of us, and we went to the farminary to really look at and experience uh, what it was like to get our hands dirty, to work um, in God's creation, to think about uh, more about how we can help in the healing uh, of God's creation. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, we had students from uh, Hartford International University. We had f uh, folks from AHCC. And one of the things that we did when we got there, it was garlic planting season. And so we got to plant hundreds and hundreds of cloves of garlic, just like these. We had to split them all up, and then we had this great tool that uh, we got to put them into the ground uh, with, and it was just an amazing day. It was an amazing, amazing day. And then 
Just this past week, uh, I got a message, uh, a text message from Nate Stuckey, who is one of the people who uh, helped, runs the farminary. Um, and he said, guess what? Guess what? The garlic that AHCC planted is just beginning to sprout. <laughs> Friends, often we plant in hopes that something will happen, but unsure. Often we give, hoping that something happens, but we're unsure. And that is where our faith comes in. We plant, we give, not knowing exactly what will be, but with the faith that new life in our world and in our very selves will come. Friends, as we give of our abundance today, as we give our offering, please know that we may not know exactly where it all goes, but we have faith that it goes to the building up of God's kingdom here in our church and in our world. So as we receive now the gift of music, let us receive our gifts and our tithes, our offerings.
God, we plant and we give in faith. Take all that we have given in your name and use it for the building of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, our scripture lesson comes to us from the fourth chapter of the book of Esther. Let us listen now together for a word from the Lord. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing in a loud and bitter cry. Then Esther called for Hethich, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend to her and ordered him to go out to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. Hethic went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction. Well, Hathak went back and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to him and gave him a message to take back to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes into the king's inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself, she said, have not been called to come into the king's inner sanctum for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will surely rise for the Jews from another place. But you, you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Who knows, he said. Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent back a reply to Mordecai, go, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of our ancestors, open each one of us here today. Open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our spirits, so that we might, we might know we might understand how it is you are speaking to us today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So in legal ease, second chair is a lawyer who assists the lead attorney in court. They help by questioning some of the witnesses, arguing some of the legal points, and handling parts of the opening statement and closing argument. Basically, the first chair counts on the second chair to have the answers ready before the questions are even asked. And it is often said that the biggest mistake a first-timer in the second chair can make at trial is to assume that the first chair knows the facts and law of the case. Never assume, as they say. In a professional orchestra, the second chair or assistant associate principal sits directly next to the concertmaster 
turning the pages of the piece they play. If there's a solo, the first chair plays it, but the second chair learns it as an understudy. The first chair decides on the bowings. The second chair player makes sure they are communicated to the rest of the section. At the Oscars, the award goes to the best supporting actress or actor in a major motion picture film. In faith communities, we often refer to them as associate ministers or associate rabbis. In government, we call them vice presidents. Or how many of you have heard the phrase, behind every great man is a really good woman? And did you know that that is actually extracted from the book of Proverbs, from the Bible? Proverbs 31, go look it up, or don't. The second chair, the supporting role. They may not come with the most acclaim or the highest accolades, but those that serve in these roles are none the less important, in fact, critical as one might say that no one in any kind of leadership role can do his or her job without a whole host of people in positions of support. You know this, right? And this is particularly true in today's Old Testament story from the book of Esther. Over the course of the last several weeks, Whenever I have been in a small group with folks from the church, I have asked, so what do you know or remember about the biblical story of Esther? And and the answers have been interesting. They have included things like a vicious and kind of gross king, a kind uncle, lots of secrets and lots of fear, and the phrase for just such a time is this. And all of these answers are actually correct. You see, the book of Esther opens with the king deposing and killing Queen Vashti because she refused to dance erotically in front of him and his drunk friends. Again, this is in the Bible. After Queen Vashti's murder, the king holds a good old-fashioned beauty pageant to find his next queen, which included Esther, an orphaned Jew who was under the legal care of her uncle, Mordecai. Eventually becoming the next queen, Esther withheld her identity as a Jew. Outside the castle walls, Haman, the king's right-hand man, got into a scuffle with Mordecai, Esther's uncle, although no one knew they were related, and angrier than a hornet, Haman gets the king to sign an edict announcing the complete annihilation of all Jews living in the city of Susa. It's kind of where we pick up today. Desperate to save his people, Mordecai sent secret notes. That was today's scripture, these kind of back and forth notes that were being sent between Esther and Mordecai. Mordecai sent secret notes to Esther, letting her... uh, letting her know of what is taking place outside of the palace walls. And he pleads with her to take immediate action, which are those famous words for just such a time is this. He reminds her that maybe she was created for exactly that moment in time, for exactly that particular mission. And it's with those words It's with her uncle's words etched upon her heart that Esther summons the courage she needs to speak directly with the king. And we heard going in to the king's palace without being summoned was against the law and actually got you death. So Esther summons the courage she needs to go in and speak directly to the king, revealing her true identity, which in turn saves all of the Jews from being killed. And the book of Esther closes with Haman being hung on the gallows he had built specifically for Mordecai. 
And, and don't get me wrong, we, we, all, we need all the strong, audacious, leading ladies we can get in the Bible. So I'm not mad that Esther gets the Oscar for her leading role in this story. But what I do want us to remember is the importance and the value of those upon whom the spotlight may never fall. You see, for such a time as this, these were not Esther's words. They were Mordecai's. But they were exactly the words she needed to hear in order to do what she needed to do. The second chair is really, really important. The I Have a Dream speech given by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is known as one of the most memorable and meaningful in American history. Yet if the, if the legendary gospel vocalist Mahalia Jackson had been somewhere other than the National Mall in Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963, it is a speech that may never, ever have been or come to be, or at least in the way that it was and is now remembered. You see, it is purported, it is purported that as he stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial outlining the long history of racial injustice in America and imploring his audience to hold their country accountable for the, uh, for the founding promises of freedom, justice, and equality, King wasn't feeling as connected to the crowd as he would have liked. Maybe it was a bigger crowd, maybe it was because it was outdoors, I'm not sure. But something that day seemed a bit off. And feeling, and feeling that energy, Jackson, who was standing to the left of King, yelled out to him, tell him about the dream, Martin. And at that moment, as can be seen in films of the speech, Dr. King leaves his prepared notes behind and begins to improvise the entire next section of his speech, the historic section that famously begins. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. The second chair is so vitally important, folks. It was Martin Luther King's speech, but without Jackson knowing exactly what he needed to hear so as to enter into the fullness of who God created him to be, it may never have happened 60 years ago. Today, today we are doing costume fittings for the Boar's Head and Yule Log Festival, to which um, festival, which is the community's, uh, this community's annual epiphany extravaganza. If you have never seen it performed, you need to. If you have no idea what a Boar's Head and Yule Log Festival is, don't be embarrassed. Just go to our website, ahcc.org. You'll find all the information you need to get up to speed. But it's, it's an amazing production. It's been happening for 50 plus years. And as it is with any great perf performance, production on Broadway or otherwise at 814 Asylum Avenue, there are coveted roles in the Boar's Head and Yule Log Festival, roles that stand out. A couple of years ago, my husband Brian and I got to be the king and queen. That was fun. There's the holly and the ivy, the log rider, the jesters, the sprite, and certainly every year, the camel steals the show. But here's the deal. As many people as there are who get to put on makeup and tights and costumes and jewelry and process out under the spotlight, 
There are just as many folks, if not more, who make the whole show happen. There are those who construct and deconstruct the set. There are those who take charge of ticket sales and marketing. Those who sew costumes and those who inventory props and apply makeup and mess with our hair. There are those who bake cookies and others who make church punch. There are those who clean up animal poop and wrangle cherubs. There are those who sing their lungs off and dance their hearts out and those who play their instruments until they're blue in the face. There are those who make us sound great. There are those who usher folks to their seats and others who usher the cast to their places. And there are those who carry the proclamation of good news to all the earth. You see, friends, as one of this church's premier events, there is something to be said for the stars. But there is as much to say about all the second chairs that make the magic happen that turn this event into a sacred moment. The second chairs really matter, right? And so, beloveds, as we enter into this season of thanksgiving and gratitude, I've seen many of you begin posting online your gratitude journals for the month of November. I would like you, I would like all of us, to take some time in the days to come to think about those people in your life who in quiet and sometimes unassuming ways have helped you realize or discover who you really are. Maybe it was a teacher, a coach, a mentor, a pastor, a neighbor, a family member, a friend, a colleague. Maybe they were aware of the impact they had on your life, but my guess is probably not. And what if in these painful and tumultuous times, we flooded the world with gratitude that, my friends, is an act of resistance. Second chairs really matter. Those in the supporting roles of our lives really matter. They help us to be exactly who it is God created us to be. Thanks be to God for second chairs.
we all get to improvise. <laughs> this is the table of the Lord, open to all. Friends, we are indeed reminded that we come together in community today to feast with our God, grateful for the ways that God has shown up and reminded us of the importance of one another, the importance of community in our very lives. And we're reminded that Jesus, on the night before he died, he gathered with his community. He gathered with those he loved most in the world to share a meal, to share in the feast of Passover, but we also know that that evening, Jesus did something different. That night, while they ate, Jesus took the bread. <clears throat> Improvise. You know that Jesus took the bread, and he lifted it up, and giving thanks, he broke it. And he said to his beloved friends, this is my body broken for you. And when you do this in times to come, you will do this remembering me. And we know that after the meal, Jesus took the cup and pouring out a new glass of wine. He said, this is my blood, which will be shed for you. It is a new covenant for the forgiveness of sin for yours and for all of you. And when you do this in times to come, you do this remembering me. Beloveds, the bread is broken and the cup is full. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come upon these elements. Upon these simple elements of faith, a bit of bread and a full cup. And help us to know, to feel, to take in your love and your grace. Amen. Here at Asylum Hill, as I said, our table is open to each and to all. You come not because you must, not because you're obligated, but we come because we can, because we are invited. We are invited by the one who loves us unconditionally and says, come. Eat, drink, and be filled. I would ask that you would come to one of the stations nearest to you, that you would take a bit of bread. We also have gluten-free bread on napkins, that you would dip it into the cup and experience the joy of God's love. I also want to remind us that on each communion Sunday, we have our Faith Lab kids in worship with us, and so they will be also experiencing the love of God in this sacrament of communion. So come, come one, come all.
Friends, let us give thanks for the gifts we have received. Thank you, O Christ, for this feast of life. We are fed by your love. We are strengthened by your life. We are set forth into this world to live into the visions God has laid on our hearts. We are now commissioned to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, love as we have been loved. Thanks be to God. Amen and Alleluia.